Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I can't start my video, but that's okay. Um, I'll just talk in the dark. <laughs> uh, as I was saying before, I've got a face for radio, so it's all good. Um, I've got the pleasure of announcing and uh, doing the intro for Eva Galperin. Uh, she's the Director of Cybersecurity at the Electronic Frontiers Foundation. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to do so, please do support their mission as well. What they do is incredibly important. Um, I've got to use a little bit of a personal story here. And uh, I first met Eva at Nolcon in Goa, India, and she just completed a talk, Cybersecurity and Privacy from the Global Lens. Uh, if you do have the opportunity, please go and review it. Um, after the talk, I, I stood around and I wanted to ask her some questions, but there were just so many people around her because, you know, she's a rock star of our industry. And I just felt you know what, I'll catch up later. And I never did, and I, I really wish I'd stuck around. Um, one of the things that Eva's really passionate about, and it's actually one of my passions as well, is actually the elimination of stalkerware. Uh, you might have seen on my Twitter feed retweeting some of the work that Eva's done in this area, and it just has to go. There's no place for this type of software in civil society. It should be illegal everywhere. Stalkers use it to spy on and abuse victims. They use it for domestic violence, they kidnap kids and they murder people. There is absolutely no, there is no room at all for this type of software. Please review her TED talk, literally her TED talk, um, for what you need to know about stalkerware and take immediate action. I really do encourage you to do that. Part of OWASP is ethics and our ethics do not allow that type of software to exist. Please get rid of it. Eva Galprin is EFS Director of Cybersecurity. Prior to 2007, uh, Eva worked in security and IT in the Silicon Valley and in degrees in political science and international relations from SFSU. Her work primarily focused on providing privacy and security for vulnerable populations around the world. To that end, she's applied the combination of her political science and technical background to everything from organizing EFS Tor Relay Challenge to writing privacy and security training materials, including surveillance, self-defense, and the digital first aid kit, which I actually have referenced to people. Um, it's a really important document. And if you're not familiar with it, please go and look it up. Um, she also published uh, research on malware in Syria, Vietnam, and Kazakhstan. Uh, when she's not collecting new and exotic malware, she practices aerial circus arts and learning new languages. And with that, Eva, thank you and take it away. Aha. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me and reminding me to unmute myself. Uh, I also deeply regret that I did not get to meet Andrew at NullCon, uh, especially since I went back the year after and essentially gave a, uh, a repeat of the same talk uh, with fewer technical difficulties. Uh, but that particular talk uh, largely had to do with uh, sort of um, overview of stalkerware all over the world. Uh, this is uh, not what I'm here to talk to you, uh, or sorry, it was an overview of like APTs all over the world. Anyway, that is not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Uh, I did a, uh, a conversation at UCLA just a few days ago uh, at an event that they called I think, something like uh, Ethics in Cybersecurity, and I had suggested that we simply call our conversation Ethics in Cybersecurity, you should have some. Uh, they would not do that, uh, presumably because there was just a limit to the amount of snark that they were uh, they were willing to put up with from me. But uh, now I have uh, I have an hour to myself, and I get to say whatever I want. So there, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we should have ethics in cybersecurity. And specifically what I wanna to talk to you about is who deserves cybersecurity and how we can expand our ideas about who deserves cybersecurity. Um, so when we think about cybersecurity, uh, we think about uh, the practice of protecting systems, networks and programs from digital attacks. And when we think about who cybersecurity is for, cybersecurity is usually thought of, uh, especially in, in an academic setting where, where you were being taught, cybersecurity is for governments. You have great big arguments about cybersecurity policy. What kind of rules should we have? We have uh, you know, arguments about uh, cybersecurity for companies, uh, about you know, locking down your, your Fortune 500 company or creating cybersecurity products. 
threats. Uh, cybersecurity often focuses on protecting people and institutions with power and money uh, for the same reason that Jesse James robbed banks. It's where the money is. Uh, notably, what cybersecurity isn't is it's not the practice of protecting people. So I'm going to talk about the ways in which this approach to cybersecurity has kept us from addressing important harms. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my vision about of what cybersecurity could be and to talk about what you as cybersecurity professionals can do in order to make that vision a reality. So I'm going to start uh, actually referencing the, the talk that I gave at Nullcon. I'm going to start with APTs. Uh, so APT is uh, short for Advanced Persistent Threat, and uh, usually when we are talking about APTs, we are talking about government or government-aligned actors. Uh, the reason why APTs get you know, sort of their own designation and they're considered to be a particularly interesting and sexy thing to study uh, is that APTs behave very differently from hackers or ransomware gangs or you know, sort of run-of-the-mill uh, criminals. Uh, you can watch uh, APTs come to work. They, they make it their job to essentially probe your, uh, your perimeter for weaknesses. And uh, you can see that in the very first APT report, uh, which I think was put out by uh, Mandiant. Uh, they put out the APT-1 report in 2013, and it described years of work by a uh, group of uh, government hackers located in China, and it focused on the work that they were doing to uh, compromise the New York Times. So they spent all of this time targeting the New York Times. And the reason that they were targeting the New York Times as an organization was that they wanted to unmask the identity of uh, some uh, sources on uh, stories about Chinese government corruption. Uh, if you are familiar with Chinese politics, uh, you are probably aware that the reason why the Chinese government was so interested in uh, discovering the identity of the, of the sources for these stories on corruption was not because they wanted to give them a prize and not because they wanted to bring them cookies. Uh, their intentions were, uh, were definitely, uh, let's just go with bad. Uh, and it was extremely important that the that the New York Times you know, sort of uh, step up its uh, privacy and security game uh, in order to protect these important sources because people's lives uh, were on the line. Uh, and what followed over the next several years were a series of other reports about APTs, about you know, sort of uh, persistent government actors. Uh, and usually these reports focused on um, Russia, uh, sometimes on Israel, sometimes on China. There were uh, reports later on uh, actions by North Korea. Uh, you saw a lot of, uh, of interest in the behavior of actors from, from the Five Eyes countries, which are the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia and uh, and the UK. Um, so all of that was extremely interesting to people. And the reason that this stuff was interesting is because those actors are sophisticated, because they're you know largely bringing their A game. Uh, at the at the time when a lot of these uh, sort of APTs were first being tracked, they weren't exactly like making use of, of ODAs left and right, um, but they they were using some sophisticated techniques. And the reason why security companies published reports about these APTs in particular was uh, also for money, not because you were going to pay for these reports. These were the reports that they were doing for free, but they were essentially free advertising showing you how sophisticated uh, they were as a security company. Our research is so good that we found the NSA. We found GCHQ. Look at me. I'm a badass. We can, you know, pinpoint these Chinese actors down to the building that they were working out of, which is a pretty neat trick. Um, so essentially, the the entire point is to uh, is to fetishize um, complexity 
and techniques and novelty uh, as as part of this effort to create a you know hype around uh, around your company and therefore sell more products. And because this was the way in which so many of us thought about information security, uh, there was a lot of interesting research that simply did not get published, that ended up on the floor, or that ended up in you know very obscure reports that nobody ever read, uh, that turned out to actually be extremely relevant. So starting in about 2011, 2012, I was traveling all over the world doing trainings for journalists and activists who were you know, increasingly being targeted by, uh, by all kinds of government actors uh, who were increasingly living their lives online and doing their work online. So everything was being kept in some sort of digital medium uh, and who were increasingly vulnerable to uh, various kinds of online surveillance. Um, so in a moment, I will, I will talk about exactly what those trainings were like, but we did notice that they were being targeted by APTs. And the way that we noticed is that I would come and I would talk to journalists and activists and they would say, hey, I got this weird email with this strange attachment. Uh, you know, so it's not even like I'm writing Yara rules. I've, I'm actually just being handed some malware and told like, this is weird. And I spent some time taking it apart. Uh, and as a result, I spent uh, probably about uh, three or four years uh, just publishing reports uh, about the uh, the APTs that we found that were targeting these journalists and activists. Um, and so what was particularly interesting about these APTs uh, was that they were... Uh, they were actors in uh, in Vietnam who were targeting um, journalists and bloggers, lawyers, uh, one mathematics professor in uh, in Australia. Uh, the Vietnamese case was particularly interesting because I had done some activism on the jailing of Vietnamese bloggers, and uh, my series of blog posts was enough to get me targeted by the Vietnamese government, and they sent some malware directly to me. Uh, I wrote it up and uh, noted their use of use of the Comic Sans font, which made it much more difficult to take their malware seriously. Um, so we wrote about uh, about Vietnam, about Lebanon, about Kazakhstan, about uh, some actors in um, in Syria that were sort of uh, pro Assad hackers that were targeting uh, opposition uh, groups in 2011, 2012. So the sort of early days of the Syrian civil war. And the reason why uh, these actors had not gotten any attention before uh, I, had, not before I started doing this work, but before a fairly small number of people started doing this work uh, was that the techniques were not interesting. The techniques were were dead simple and stupid. There were these were you know attachments with word docs and PDFs. There were you know links uh, to uh, to videos that took advantage of extremely well known flash vulnerabilities. Uh, we uh, we saw you know basically every every old and and boring exploit in the book. But what was particularly interesting about this stuff was uh, the analysis of the lures that they were using, which were designed to be very compelling to the people who were doing activism in these particular spaces. So it was uh, a lot of stuff like uh, a, an actor would, uh, would compromise a, uh, a Facebook group, then they would start seeding the Facebook group with links to a fake YouTube page uh, that is supposed to contain, uh, you know, videos of Assad's depravities. Uh, so again, very, uh, very simple techniques, but extremely effective. And what mattered more than anything else was uh, that the stakes were very high. Uh, we saw that uh, people who were being targeted with this kind of malware uh, were being picked up by Assad's uh, security forces and never seen again. Uh, we uh, we know that Vietnam again very famous for uh, for jailing journalists 
and activists and the the links to between the behavior of the APT between the being targeted uh, for surveillance and violence were uh, increasingly clear. Um, but again, nobody paid attention. And the reason that they did not pay attention was because the, tech the techniques were not interesting. And the stakes, if you were an information security person, seemed to be very small. Uh, they were not um, attacking the New York Times, which has a lot of money, which then went ahead and put a lot of money into securing its newsroom, uh, most notably hiring uh, Runa Sandovic from Tor, uh, who I think ran uh, security at the New York Times uh, newsroom for many years. And uh, we also started seeing other um, news organizations come up that touted their extremely good security teams and security practices, uh, most notably Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg was ahead of the game in terms of securing their newsroom because they are essentially uh, they were financial reporters. And it turns out that there is a lot of money in protecting financial data online. Uh, so they were they were doing this before everybody else. And then, you know, sort of later in the game, uh, around the time of the Snowden revelations, we started to see uh, organizations like uh, the Intercept, which was founded by billionaire or funded by billionaire Pierre Omidar. Uh, and uh, they also made a big deal of having, you know, this sort of roster of rock star cybersecurity people uh, who were working for them. Uh, to you know, varying levels of effectiveness. Um, so again, the big problem here was that uh, people were not paying attention to the stuff that was targeting activists or journalists if they were doing activism somewhere small, if they were on the periphery, if they were freelance journalists, if they were somewhere inexpensive, if they didn't have a lot of money for trainings or in order to buy tools. These are not the people who interest a company like Mandiant uh, because there's just there's no money to be made in, uh, in protecting them. And that's one of the reasons why these reports uh, were written by, by me and also by, you know, I would say about half a dozen other colleagues in the space uh, who, who took an interest in doing this sort of thing and why no one had done it before. Uh, so what I really want to emphasize here is uh, that we took an, an approach where instead of fetishizing the uh, how you know how sophisticated the techniques were we really focused on uh, on the people and the people who were largely being ignored were the people who were without power and without money so i i talked a little bit about the about the work on apts and the work on uh, training for uh, for journalists and activists so journal training for journalists and activists became uh sort of a very big deal in you know the somewhere around 2010, 2011, and the sort of scene in which I traveled, suddenly it became apparent that, uh, that journalists uh, were under attack and that they were hugely unprepared uh, to protect their sources or themselves. Uh, I once asked uh, NPR journalist uh, Andy Carvin, who had become famous for being able to do uh, really interesting work in Syria. At the time, journalists were not allowed into Syria, and so he did um, nearly all of his work, well, I guess all of his work, uh, with using sources inside of Syria that he communicated with over the internet. Uh, and uh, as a result, lots of people were kind of calling uh, the um, the beginnings of the Syrian civil war, the, uh, the the Skype revolution, because there were so many people using Skype. Um, but I asked Andy how he normally got in touch with his um, with his sources, and he said that uh, the uh, the exact you know end to end encrypted communications that they were using mattered much less than the fact that uh, that they were using Tor. Uh, that they would start with Tor and then they would figure out what tool they wanted to use in order to communicate. Uh, and he was asked why, and he replied with all of the people I know who are not using Tor are dead. So again, the stakes were extremely high. Uh, and it turned out uh, that training for uh, 
for organizations like the New York Times or Thomson Reuters uh, became available fairly quickly. And they started taking their security much more seriously uh, very early on, and they were able to put a lot of money into it. And so they got uh, a lot of attention. But uh, not all journalists and activists are created equal. Uh, there are many journalists, uh, I would say the majority of journalists in this world do not work for large newsrooms. They work as uh, as freelancers and they are entirely on their own when it comes to uh, you know, researching and filing their stories. And they, uh, at the time at least, were uh, left on their own when it came to matters of uh, digital security, which was very alarming. Uh, the same was largely true of activists. Uh, sure, there are large organizations like, you know, Human Rights Watch and the ACLU and uh, the Amnesty International, uh, and they have many activists, some of which are actually part of the organization and are paid, and they manage to move relatively quickly to uh, sort of locking down things for the activists that they worked with directly. But much like journalism, there is a whole periphery of activists uh, who are largely acting um, in improvised groups, who become activists largely by accident, who do not plan their operational security well in advance, and that left them exceptionally vulnerable. Uh, so one of the things that I did as part of my work with the Electronic Frontier Foundation was I uh, helped to revamp uh, our uh, surveillance self-defense guide. Uh, surveillance self-defense can be found at ssd.eff.org, and it is essentially all of EFF's uh, digital privacy and security advice. At the time that we started doing this, uh, there were a lot of other uh, privacy and security guides online, and uh, they had a number of very interesting problems that I saw over and over again. Before I started working on this revamp, the first thing that I did was I took a look at the entire space and I saw problems. Uh, the biggest problem that I encountered was that these guides were not updated. So people would write a guide with a, you know, with a list of tools or a series of advice or, you know, some sort of uh, sketch that tries to explain to you the difference between, uh, you know, your, your data encrypted at rest and your data encrypted in transit. And uh, nobody would update anything. Uh, furthermore, there were no dates on the guides themselves, so you didn't even know how out of date the guide was or how out of date the advice was. Um, there were also problems with translation. Frequently, these guides were not translated into other languages, or if they were translated into other languages, they were translated poorly. Uh, Furthermore, the, uh, even if they were translated and translated well, uh, often we found that the uh, translations would very quickly go out of date because if you make one small change to your guide, which is translated into eight languages, you then have to go and translate it into your eight languages. So those were some very serious problems. Um, but there were also two sort of larger problems that I wanted to address in creating a version of uh, a revamped surveillance self-defense that, uh, that would help journalists and activists and really a lot of other people who are on the periphery, the people who are without power and people who are without money. And uh, the first was, I noticed that there was no discussion in all of these privacy security guides of threat modeling, that no one talked about who this guide was for. Because as we know, privacy and security are not one size fits all. And trying to protect everything from everybody all the time is just a way to get completely exhausted. So frequently these guides assumed a certain kind of, uh, of reader. Uh, and often the kind of reader that they assumed was a person like themselves. Uh, frequently, these guides were being written by, you know, white men in their 20s located in, you know, the United States or Europe. 
and they were often uh, prone to the kinds of assumptions uh, that you see where everyone just assumes that people are like themselves, that you have uh, the latest in technology, that you have a steady internet, uh, that you are probably not facing uh, harassment just for existing. Um, so it's a, it's a very different kind of world. And as a result, there were a lot of people whose needs were left out of these guides. Uh, and again, this was because people thought about the people with uh, at the center with the power and the money or the people who were like them with the power and the money. And they did not think about the people who are on the periphery. The other uh, thing that I was really not seeing in guides uh, until about 2007, 2008, uh, this was um, an, an approach which I, I really started to see, uh, you know, kind of um, pioneered by frontline defenders, which was uh, an, an approach that didn't talk down to the people who were reading the guide and that didn't treat the people who were reading the guide like, if you don't follow my advice, you don't deserve privacy or security. Um, I really admired uh, some of the early guides that were very clearly following the principles of harm reduction. So you may or may not be familiar with harm reduction. Uh, harm reduction is a, uh, is a philosophy taken from uh, the people who are largely working, uh, doing outreach to drug users. And uh, harm reduction has, I think, something like six different uh, principles. But the, the most important thing to know about harm reduction is that it accepts, for better or for worse, that illicit or uh, Illicit drug use is part of our world and chooses to work to minimize its harmful effects rather than simply ignore or condemn them. Um, so uh, you may be wondering what that has to do with teaching um, privacy and security online. And what it has to do with that is uh, just substitute drugs for Facebook. Uh, for example, uh, it was extremely common for the people who were writing privacy and security guides to simply tell people, well, Facebook is bad, you should get off Facebook. If you're using Facebook and you have privacy or security problems, you have only yourself to blame. It's not like you thought Mark Zuckerberg rolled out of bed and was like, hey, I'm going to protect journalists and activists. Uh, and that is an extremely counterproductive approach, uh, especially in countries like Russia, where nearly all activism online happens on Facebook. Um, so as a person who has, who has done some activism and uh, who has worked with activists uh, extensively over the years, I can tell you that the, the best way to get, uh, to get people on board with uh, with good privacy and security is to start by understanding their needs and not judging them. Uh, and that is what I think of as the harm reduction approach to teaching uh, privacy and security online. And it works for uh, it works for, you know, do you use Facebook? It works for questions like, do you use end-to-end -end encrypted uh, messaging? Uh, are you using your real name on these various services? You can tell people what best practices are, uh, but you also need to have a plan for what you are going to do when the people that you are teaching uh, need to ignore some of those best practices because they don't work for them. So somewhere around 20, uh, 2016, after many years of working on surveillance self-defense, uh, it turned out that uh, a lot of people were interested in doing these security trainings that I had spent so much time putting together and for which I had spent all this time putting together uh, secure, security and uh, digital privacy advice. Um, somewhere around November of 2016, for some reason. And... Um, we started to put together another guide called the Security Education Companion. And that was really where I, I tried to put all of my ideas 
about, uh, about harm reduction, about meeting people where they are, about the importance of threat modeling. Uh, I think in the current version of the Security Education Companion, there is even a lengthy discussion of uh, how for some, uh, for some populations, the term threat modeling uh, is, uh, is triggering. It feels very threatening to them and they're not receptive to it because they feel that it sounds like something out of the military and not like something that we have borrowed uh, from software development. And uh, so we talk a little bit about other approaches to threat modeling that you might use in populations that feel that way around that language, rather than simply saying, well, if you can't stand me talking about threat modeling, then uh, you don't deserve to learn how to threat model. This is uh, simply not the, not the approach that we should be taking. So while I was doing all of this work on APTs and uh, doing trainings for journalists and activists. Uh, it turns out that uh, one of the guys with whom I was doing the majority of my, uh, my APT reporting uh, turned out to be a serial rapist. And uh, it turned out he had sexually assaulted a lot of women. And uh, there were a series of articles in which uh, his survivors spoke out. Uh, in January of 2018, I read an article that interviewed the uh, survivors in, um, in New Zealand. And one of the things that really struck me about the stories of the survivors was uh, the emphasis that they put on uh, the security measures that they were taking, that all of them were you know, putting their phones away and they had stickers over the um, over the cameras on their laptops, and they were scared. They were absolutely terrified of this guy. And the reason that they were so scared was that they were afraid that he was going to compromise uh, their, their phones and their laptops and other devices, which was apparently a thing that he had threatened to do. And I was so angry that uh, I, I did what I usually do when I'm mad, which was I tweeted. And I tweeted that if you were a woman who had been targeted by, uh, uh, by a sexual predator and you were worried about uh, your device, that I would go ahead and um, make sure that you got a you know, decent forensic analysis if you reached out directly to me. And then I think I went to lunch. I, I just sort of ignored this tweet. I, my anger had dissipated and uh, I, I was ready to get on with my day. And I did not expect that it would be retweeted 10,000 times. I did not expect that I would be contacted by more than a dozen people per day uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, I did, I think approximately a dozen abuse cases every day for the better part of a year. I, and the last time that I worked on an abuse case from somebody who, who came to me because they were concerned about their, uh, about their device having been compromised uh, by someone who had sexually assaulted them was this morning. So I'm, I'm still doing it. Uh, but uh one of the things that I was really angry about was uh, that a lot of the of the people who came to me had uh, problems that fell into two categories. Uh, the first was that most people were not getting compromised uh, in uh, their their devices were not being compromised. Uh, their accounts were being compromised. So I saw a compromise of email accounts of uh, social media accounts, of you know, just, just about everything. If it, if it had a login, I saw it compromised. And uh, the good news is that we have solutions to the compromise problem. Uh, we can tell people to use strong passwords, to use a uh, password manager, uh, and to use the, um, the strongest uh, version of 2FA, which is available and that they are comfortable using. Because again, it's very important to meet people where they are and not where you think that they need to be. So now that that is, is out of the way, there was not a lot to do for, uh, for the people who are concerned about stalkerware 
uh, for the people who are concerned about the uh, class of software that is commercially available uh, to ordinary people for purchase that allows them to, uh, when, when they covertly install it on somebody else's device, to get all of, the, all of the data from that device, including keystrokes and screenshots and phone calls and passwords. And, uh, and if, if the device includes location data, like our phone does, because we're all carrying tracking devices around in our pockets now, um, you also have an excellent way of keeping track of, uh, of the location of a person, which makes it great for stalking. Um, so my first thought was that, wait a minute, isn't there an entire industry devoted to uh, building software that sits on your device and tells you whether or not there's something you don't want on it? Uh, isn't that what antivirus is supposed to be? And so I did a little bit of research and uh, I tested out the, you know, I, I tried out the top uh, stalkerware products uh, against the top antivirus products. And uh, honestly, antivirus did not come out looking very good. Uh, I think I got on average something like a 60% hit rate for the latest versions of uh, the most popular stalkerware products for I think something like the top 10 uh, AV products that, uh, that I tried out. So that was disappointing. Uh, and I turned around and went to the AV companies. Uh, I started with some AV companies that had had some uh, very bad press that year, and, such as Kaspersky, uh, because I am not afraid to pick the, uh, the weak off of the herd. And I came to them and I said, you know, hey, how would you like some press that doesn't suck? Uh, and I convinced them to not only uh, scan specifically for stalkerware, uh, but also to put up a, you know, specific alert that let the user know that what they found was not just any kind of potentially unwanted program, but was specifically stalkerware. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, my organization, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, along with nine other organizations, including uh, Kaspersky and Norton LifeLock and uh, Avast and uh, the bunch of other uh, companies uh, all got together and formed the Coalition Against Stalkerware. Uh, one of the things that the Coalition Against Stalkerware does is uh, we exchange samples of, uh, of stalkerware so that everyone can benefit from everyone else's stalkerware research. And if you take a look at uh, the research from uh, organizations like AV Comparatives, you can see that the um, the, the detection of stalkerware uh, by the top AV companies against the you know, top selling stalkerware products uh, for, for the last several years has steadily been going up and is now uh, for many products in the 95% to 99% range. Uh, so that was an area in which we really made a big difference and, uh, and I'm very proud. Uh, but Again, we need to take a look at why, why were things like this in the first place? And the reason that we got to where we were uh, was that uh, AV companies felt a great deal of ambivalence around what they thought of as dual use products. Uh, people from AV companies frequently told me that because there were legitimate reasons why you might want to install something on somebody's device, uh, that uh, you know, tracks everything that they do, that it might be a little bit sketchy to uh, call it out as malicious. So what I did was uh, I got together with the Coalition Against Stalkerware and said, listen, we need to come up with a definition of stalkerware that is, uh, you know, that is really tight and, uh, and catchy. And so what we did was we, uh, we agreed on a definition of stalkerware as uh, the class of software that uh, is installed on directly on devices uh, and that uh, deliberately hides its presence on the device. Uh, it uh, 
does not regularly alert the user to its presence, which makes it much more difficult uh, to, to detect and certainly much more difficult to remove. So we really put the emphasis on consent. Uh, prior to that, there was a feeling that if you needed the username and password um, of a device in order to install the software on the device, that uh, this was the same as having legitimate access. Uh, and what I did was I came to the AV companies and I said, I don't think you understand how abuse works. It is extremely common in abuse cases to see uh, that uh, the survivors of abuse have been pressured by their abusers into sharing their username and their password. And they said, well, how about physical uh possession of the device. And I said, well, frequently, these are people who are living with their abusers. So they have physical possession of the device and they have the username and the password. You need to start thinking again, like a survivor of, uh, of abuse and not like a, you know, comfortable, well-paid uh, white man living in Santa Clara. So this is one of the ways in which the uh, Coalition Against Stalkerware uh, did very important work, largely by centering the needs of, uh, of people that the AV industry had, uh, had simply not thought about and had not considered to be important. Um, because honestly, uh, survivors of sexual abuse are not the first thing that AV companies think of when they think about who is going to give their money for their products. Um, so the, uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about real quick was uh, that you can tell that a lot of the work that I'm talking about is uh, has to do with speaking out, uh, with uh, pub publishing research or talking to a company and getting them to do something or forming a coalition. And um, there's an entire sort of class of people who do this. Uh, Bruce Schneier refers to them as public interest technologists. Some good examples of public interest technologists include uh, the researchers at Citizen Lab, uh, including Citizen Lab's director, Ron Diebert, John Scott Railton, Bill Martzak, um, Matt Mitchell, who I think most recently was working at the Ford Foundation, uh, who is one of the founders of Crypto Party Harlem, and uh, who was, uh, recently received from, uh, EFF's Pioneer Award, uh, I think last week. Um, the uh, Congress has a uh, sort of fellowship called the Congressional Tech Fellows, where they hire tech people specifically to be tech advisors to congressmen. Uh, and essentially to, to look at these problems and say, hey, this thing is good, this thing is bad, explain you know, the difference between different types of encryption uh, to, to the people who are making these kinds of decisions. Uh, and finally, I would also point to Consumer Reports. Consumer Reports has done some really uh, groundbreaking work uh, in terms of public interest technology recently, and I'm very excited by what they're doing. Um, but it is not enough to work in the public interest. What we need to do is center the needs and experiences of populations whose needs have traditionally been pushed to the periphery of cybersecurity. So uh, explicitly, that's women, LGBTQ populations, uh, people of color, people in authoritarian countries, uh, activists without money, journalists without money, the homeless, people with disabilities, including visual and hearing disabilities, survivors of intimate partner abuse. Uh, and the reason why we need to do this is because, as you can see from the stories that I have just told you, if you center their needs when you're building your products and making your policies, you will also address the needs of the comfortable 20-something middle-class white man living in Santa Clara and wearing a hoodie. But if you build a system for comfortable 20-something middle-class white men living in Santa Clara and wearing hoodies, then you will leave all of these other people out in the cold. The good news is that we're making progress. Uh, the White House executive order in March of this year established a gender policy council to investigate the ways in which jour uh, women journalists are disproportionately targeted and silenced by online harassment, which I think is very exciting. Um, and I'm really glad to see that the, that the White House 
is, is starting to understand that cybersecurity is not just about governments and it's not just about organizations. It's not just about securing our infrastructure. There are many ways in which uh, we are really failing to give people security or privacy uh, in their digital lives. And that is something that I think we should really be focusing on. As cybersecurity professionals, you are powerful, you're influential, and the decisions that you make in your work about what you build and how you build it, how it's locked down, and what is important to protect, and who is important to protect, and what protection even looks like matters. Uh, one of the things that I frequently hear from people who work in information security is, uh, well, if I don't build it, somebody else will build it. And that's simply not true. If you don't build it, and also someone else refuses to build it, and the next guy refuses to build it, then somewhere down the line, it doesn't get built. Uh, you are the tipping point. You are the person who makes the choices. And your choices matter, especially in an industry where uh, there is a tremendous labor shortage. And so your, your labor is precious. Don't use it to do evil things. So together, my hope is that we can build a cybersecurity practice that, that focuses on the needs of people and specifically the needs of people on the periphery, because that is the only way we're ever going to move beyond perpetuating the existing inequalities in which we are all stuck. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I will now take questions. Thank you. That was very, very informative. Um, I was going to ask, you know, beyond just simply getting this sort of cybersecurity um, practice going for the folks who have generally been left out, are there any actions that you can take uh, with your local politicians or um, similar that can help make like stalkerware go away or at least become so socially unacceptable that it is becomes less of a problem? Well, there's actually a really interesting thing that's happening in Stalkerware right now, uh, latest Stalkerware news. Uh, the first is that uh, I think it was two weeks ago, the FTC issued a ban on a Stalkerware company called uh, Spyphone. They issued the ban on the company itself, on its parent company, Support King, and also uh, directly on its CEO. And this is the very first time that the FTC has issued such a ban. Uh, they are currently in a 30-day uh, comment period. So you can actually comment to the FTC and uh, let them know that this is the sort of thing you want to see them doing. There is also uh, an additional bit of uh, latest uh, stalkerware news, which is uh, that there's a company called PC Tattletale. Um, and uh, I think Vice broke this story yesterday that uh, in addition to making stalkerware, PC's, uh, PC Tattletale does not make stalkerware very well. And it was possible to go through its CNC uh, and all of the content that they were exfiltrating from, uh, from people's devices simply by incrementing a URL. So that's not very secure. Uh, and it would be a good idea to write to the FTC and make them aware of this case. Uh, because if companies like uh, like Spyphone are unacceptable, surely companies like PC Tattletale are unacceptable as well. Uh, so I think that the FTC approach is uh, is very very strong right now. Uh, the other thing that people can do is actually peer pressure. It turns out that a lot of people seem to think that spying on their partner's phone uh, or other device is somehow okay, that it's justifiable, mm -hmm. that it's not harmful. Uh, often I hear that it's justified if you think your partner is cheating or if they have done something bad to you. Uh, and I think we really need to stop thinking about uh, stalkerware as software that leads to abuse and to understand that the surveillance itself is abusive. Uh, if you have reached the point where you are doing this kind of surveillance of your partner, you already know what you need to do. And it's not spy on your partner. It's dump them. Dump them before they turn you into an abuser. Yeah. 
So a personal experience of mine was my wife wanted to put some a similar sort of piece of software. It's very common in families. I think it's called Life something or another. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, I don't want to advertise it. Um, and I was extraordinarily upset with that. And I explained exactly how those products are used to control um, children. You know, I think you and I are probably lucky enough that we weren't controlled in that way. People were, you know, respectful of uh, not looking in your diary or your journal, but they seem to think nothing of spying completely on their children. Um, what are your thoughts about that? I hesitate to tell parents just like, oh, just let your children run feral. And part of that is harm reduction, because if I tell parents, just let your children run feral, what am I going to do when they don't? Um, I think that if you feel the need to track what your children are doing online or to track their location uh, by installing something on their phone, that it needs to be something that they can see and understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, That they need to be aware of what you're doing, of how powerful it is, and the scope of how it works. And you need to have a conversation about your expectations. Um, You should not fool your children in the same way that you should not fool your partners, and you should not fool your employees, and you should Mm -hmm. not, you know, fool strangers. There's, uh, you know, behavior you are interested in tracking. Uh, Surveillance without consent is unethical, and uh, in many contexts, it is also illegal. Okay. We have one comment. Um, Basically, um, Linux Girl says, thanks for the work you do to support uh, for the EFF and to support the important mission. How can people get involved with the EFF and how can they support the EFF uh, financially? Mm. So uh, EFF is essentially a T-shirt and sticker company uh, with some, you know, lawyers and uh, and activists attached. Uh, EFF is supported uh, largely by uh, members. We have 40,000 members all over the world. And you can go to www.eff.org and become a member. You can send us some money in support. And in exchange, we will send you T-shirts, stickers, regular updates of everything that is wrong on the internet and how you can fix it through uh, through clicking on things. Uh, and uh, you can also be kept up to date about uh, you know, important EFF talks such as this one. Okay. Thank you so much. I don't know that we actually have uh, any more. There's just one other observation. You may want to check it out. We, uh, Eva, I believe you're going to be on the channel for at least probably a few minutes after this. Mm-hmm. Um, but thank you so much for presenting and I really appreciate Very, very good keynote. I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon, hopefully in person. (laughs) Thank you so much. I look forward to the day we can have in-person conferences again. Yes, me too. Very much so. Okay. I'll pass it back to our organizers. Thank you.